Hey, hello. Um, great, I've got quite an ambitious uh, amount of stuff to talk about, so I'm going to try and go at a decent uh, pace. So I won't dwell too long on... Are you going to click? Oh, there we go. I was like, is it just... Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm Liam Welton. I'm a senior game designer at Dalala Studios. Um, coming up to 12 years in the industry, and I've held quite a few different roles. Um, so that sort of informs the way that I approach game design, having been a you know, programmer and sound designer. Um, as I say, uh, I work for the Lala Studios. We are a small studio based out in Essex. Um, we worked on the 2020 Battletoads um, just reboot. Um, and uh, recently worked on uh, Illusion Island. Uh, we've got a lot of compliments for all of our games. Um, and the most recent one, as I say, Illusion Island, is, are you going to play? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, don't think it wants to. No, here we go. Here we go. Um, yeah, uh, Illusion Island is a 2D hand drawn um, open world platformer um, inspired by Metroidvanias, that sort of a structure. It's four player couch co op uh, featuring Minnie, Mickey, Donald, and Goofy. Um, it's designed for um, families to enjoy, so, sort of broad age range and uh, features platforming challenges primarily. There's no combat in our game. This is a game that's all about the joy of movement and exploring this big open world. So a couple of things about the nature of um, like the making of the game. Uh, quite an ambitious timeline for the game, a 27 month dev cycle. Uh, it was a pretty big team. Um, many of those were um, artists and animators. So in a lot of the key roles, uh, quite a small number of people working on that. Only three designers, five coders, one person doing UI and UX. And as I mentioned before, it was an open world game. It was a platformer. It was couch co-op and we were aiming at family friendly. That sort of came with a bunch of its own uh, considerations, like each one of those genres. Um, platformers tend to be all about input precision and reaction timings. Open world games, it's all about rewarding that exploration, um, combining critical and non-critical content. You often can get lost and confused as to where you're going in these sorts of games. Uh, couch co-op, um, it's all about experiencing this together, and making sure that everyone is being challenged, but also it's meeting their individual challenge needs, if, it makes, if that makes sense. Uh, lots of information on screen typically in a co-op game you can risk that being quite overwhelming and then fam family friendly we were really looking for something that would be easy to pick up uh, but you know if you're an experienced gamer there's enough there to keep you like interested and entertained so we sort of took a look at the audience and the kind of breakdown of who we were looking for and we knew we wanted to make an accessible game, something that everyone can like pick up and play, hopefully. And that's partly because the game needed to have broad appeal. Uh, the characters, Mickey and, and friends, they are universally sort of loved, maybe. No, I think pretty universally loved. Um, and uh, we wanted to make sure that if you were a fan of those characters and those worlds, that was something that you this game wouldn't be a barrier to you enjoying that. We had to make sure that it had that sort of broad appeal. And then, because it's a family game, this might be someone's first ever game. So that was something we wanted to make sure we were kind of accommodating. So with all of these considerations, when we were looking at the game design, we were really trying to go, okay, what serves all of these things? And trying to be very like conscious about like each type of player and the ways that we could accommodate them. 
we came up with this um, sort of pillar, creative pillar, which was awesome alone, better together. And that was sort of like our guiding light and guiding principle whenever we were working on stuff. It needed to be something that people could enjoy on their own, but also because it was a co-op game, something that they'd have even more fun if they were playing with, with other people. So the process we took was to, in previous games, we've sort of, there's always been this question of like, when do you approach looking at accessibility? Do you do it at the beginning? Do you kind of leave it to the end? That's never the answer, just in case you're wondering. Um, and the sort of answer that we came up with was, this is an ongoing thing throughout development. So we'd start off with concepting and we'd sort of go, what is this challenge that we're trying to do? We're making a platformer. Yes, they are, about, um, they are often about precision. They're often about timing, but specifically, what is this challenge that we're trying to do? Like, what makes it fun? Why is this in the game? Do we actually really need this? Then when we came around to implementing, we would sort of measure up against what we were trying to challenge. And we would kind of go, is this still worth having in the game? Is this, actually, is this challenge actually fun? Like, who is, um, like, how, like, who are we targeting with this challenge? Um, is an, are enough people experiencing the challenge that we, we were originally setting out to do? And then when we got to polishing, we would kind of go, well, where does this fit in the entire game? And is there anything we can do that is going to bring more people into having the specific challenge that we were um, aiming for? And also just, again, still validating against, is this fun? So I'm going to take a single feature and kind of break down some of the considerations that we had for that one feature alone. Um, and this is about as you know, basic a feature that we have in our game, it's the double jump. Um, so we concepted it uh, knowing that we wanted analog inputs. Um, our game is so much about the joy and freedom of movement. We wanted to make sure that the players felt like they had uh, real control over the way that their characters were moving. Um, that included uh, how high you jump being affected by how long you're pressing down the button. That felt really important to us to make sure that you had that level of precision and that one-to-one -one connection with your character. Your double jump gives you distance instead of height. Uh, the reason for that is screens are typically very wide and instead of being very tall. When we are a cop game, that means that anything that a player can do to gain vertical distance from one another has a real uh, chance of separating the pack. So we wanted to make sure that players were all sticking together so we wouldn't have ongoing camera issues. Obviously, focusing four cameras with uh, four players with a single camera is very, very hard. So we opted to make your double jump go wide rather than tall. So a lot of our ability gatings that we had, sort of locking you out of being able to access parts of the world until you've gone and gained that ability. Um, we put that uh, over like distances that were far away rather than high up. Um, coyote time. Um, this is something that a lot of games tend to have. Essentially, uh, if you're running towards the edge of a platform, we give you a grace period um, during which you can continue your jump. We don't just immediately make you fall off. This, this is really just a question of leniency. Like how much, how much fun is a platformer if you, you just miss out on jumping at the right time and you plummet to you know, your, your death is not really the sort of challenge that we were looking for. If people have recognized that they need to jump, we're just giving that leniency to them. That's good enough for us. And then finally, rope drop. This was a multiplayer consideration. Um, in multiplayer, you can go to the edge of a platform, drop a rope down, and the other player is able to run up and then press a button, and they will climb the rope and be able to join you on the platform. The idea here is if one person's uh, proven that they can overcome the challenge, that's good enough for us. If they choose to then go and continue trying to accomplish that on their own, uh, any other follow-up players, absolutely we're delighted that they want to do that, but we're not going to limit players. If one person makes it, they can help their friends, which also builds into this whole idea of it being more fun playing together. 
So when we got to implementing, um, we started uh, testing. We did a uh, couple of different types of user testing. We did lab-based testing, had people like in the room and we uh, observed them playing, got their feedback. We also did remote user testing and we started getting feedback on this feature. Um, one thing we noticed immediately was uh, that code time's great, but on the other side, people were subtly missing. So we we made it so that you could mantle an edge that you'd only just missed. Again, if you've made the jump, it's just adding that little bit of leniency. It in no way negatively impacted the challenge as far as we were concerned. We also made sure that the jump spacing was really consistent throughout the game. You should be able to look at a screen shot of our game and understand the challenge that we're asking you to do. We've kind of made sure every jump, the height and the width, very, very consistent. We also made sure that something that we're asking you to land on was a consistent width. Again, this is about recognition for the player. Um, also in four player, it's good to make sure that everyone's got a reasonably big target and they're not all having to cluster together. While we were doing this, we are also making sure that the, um, the walkable um, terrain was very, very clear. We have these um, sort of like high contrast uh, lines underneath our platforms and on our floors to absolutely hammer home, home the idea that this is walkable, like that needs to be the highest contrast area of our game. Um, we also noticed that people were using and uh, liking the rope drop mechanic, but it was quite uh, fiddly to use. You had to go to the edge of a platform, um, the rope was quite short, um, and so it was making it difficult for both people who wanted to drop the rope and people who wanted to climb the rope. So we kind of went back and went, okay, well, why are we, what are these limitations and do we need them? So we made it so that you could drop the rope through any platform uh, and it would go to any distance. There's basically no time that you can't use this ability because we're making the promise to players that they can help one another. Um, we have to kind of follow through on that promise. When we got through to polishing, we sort of realized some of the choices we'd made had made it difficult for a subsection of our testers. Um, that analog jump um, was great, but it was causing problems if people didn't feel they were getting the height that they wanted. So we put in an option to basically make our analog jump into non-analog. Um, you tap it and you'll just get the full height. The same thing was true of our double jump where you were like having to double tap. We find some uh, users were struggling with um, tapping that at the right time so they got the longest possible distance. Um, we just made it so that we cache the input and we just give you that full distance regardless of when you tapped. This felt like, like a very easy thing for us to add in relatively easy. Um, and when we got back and we started um, testing in front of people again, we were finding those issues were no longer there. Okay, so now we go into the sort of quick fire features section where I can't go into so much detail. <laughs> So first of all, controller input. We have very few inputs in our game. We use the analog stick, um, the home start menu button, and uh, three of the face buttons. We wanted to keep it really, really simple. Again, um, we, we knew it would make it overly complicated, overly difficult to play if we were using you know, every button under the sun. We really wanted to make it so that this felt friendly, approachable, um, and so we, we kind of simplified the game design to accommodate a simpler control scheme. And as much as possible, we made those um, inputs uh, quite context um, specific. This also meant that we freed up all of the D-pad. Um, so we, you can control our, our game now with either the D-pad or the, um, the analog stick, which was a real benefit. And finally, because we were using so few buttons, it all maps onto a single Joy-Con. So if you own a Switch, uh, this multiplayer game that we really wanted to play as a multiplayer game, you can immediately, as long as you've got someone there with you, you can share your controller and you can both experience it. With health, we knew that that was going to be a big part of 
the challenge for some people constantly having to like repeat uh, challenges um, or kind of encountering things that they just couldn't overcome. So we decided to let players just set their starting health. Like after a lot of playing, we were like, we had faith that the game was fun enough that it didn't need um, a particularly punitive um, health system uh, in order for that challenge to be fun. Um, we knew some people would want that level of challenge, so we absolutely gave give them that opportunity. If you want this to be a one-hit kill game, you can set your health to one heart and you can have that experience. But if you don't want that, you can increase your number of hearts. We let you do this at the start of the game. We let you change it any time during the game. And in multiplayer, this isn't a one setting for everyone. This is per player. You can play with someone who's playing on one heart you can have three hearts. We absolutely support that. Also, we realized that we could just remove this entirely. So you can also have infinite HP, just play the entire game and not get hurt. Again, we didn't think this was negatively impacting the fun of the game and it would make it so that more people could enjoy it. I've mentioned Rope Drop. This is one of a number of multiplayer assists that we had. Um, we also have hugging. Uh, this is again related to health. Uh, if one player requests a hug, another player can go up to them and they will embrace and both of you get a temporary heart. Um, this is a way for players to support one another through challenging sections by basically boosting their, their health. Um, in our swimming sections, we realized we didn't really have anything that was equivalent to the rope drop. Um, and we wanted that same feeling of if one of you can overcome this challenge, there's no reason why we're going to block the progress of others. Um, so we literally make it so you can summon a player to you. Uh, we've also got Leapfrog. Uh, this does nothing. It's, it's just a bit of fun. Sometimes you just got to put the fun thing in. Um, when it came to making sure players didn't get um, lost or confused as to where their next goal was, one of the real things we noticed in other Metroidvanias is there's a lot of backtracking and there's a lot of encountering areas you can't uh, get to yet, but you will have to come back to. Um, this can be really, really confusing for players. So we put um, ability gate icons in the game. Um, these are little objects that basically say, okay, this is a stop sign right now. You can't go any further. Don't worry, turn back. We also um, reinforce that with uh, a similar icon on the map. But once you've gone and gained an ability, we turn that into an icon that reflects that ability. Um, this index of icons we have in the uh, pause menu at all times, so you can go and reference them. This basically means that if you're ever not sure what to do, you can check your map and you've basically got a little list of things that you've recently gained access to. This is something that we kind of noticed in other games, uh, players sort of manually doing themselves by placing down manual uh, markers. Um, but we wanted to support as many people in doing that and having that kind of experience with our game. So we just put it in as a, a base feature. Um, we did also have a bunch of um, like settings that you could tweak. Um, I've sort of mentioned the jump assist and the boost jump as well. Um, we do have wall cling assist. We have wall jumping in our game and the way it works is you jump onto a wall and then you slowly slide down. And if you press jump again, you will leap away from the wall. We noticed in play testing this was creating a lot of precise timing uh, that some players were struggling with. So we add an ability to essentially stop that slide. So you just stick permanently to the wall. Um, our game features a lot of speed-based challenges, um, timed platforms, um, hazards that flick on and off. And um, we decided to create um, a setting, a global setting that just ratchets that down that difficulty um, or that timing precision. Uh, you can have them move much, much slower than uh, the 
than normal speed. Uh, we also added a bunch of um, bunch of features that we thought would just uh, broadly uh, improve the experience for a bunch of people, affecting the text speed, subtitles, color, their size, uh, rumble intensity on the controller, and that can be very difficult and distracting for a lot of people. Uh, screen shake, same. Um, these felt like uh, good, uh, good settings to give the control to the final form. Um, in post-launch, we wanted to continue a commitment to looking at and improving our game. Um, we took another look at some of the timed elements and sort of broadened the amount that uh, were affected by it. Um, there were certain things that we'd sort of failed to uh, catch on our first pass round. So we made sure that in, in post-launch, when we were looking at um, uh, releasing patches and DLC, that was something that we went back and grabbed. Um, we noticed that uh, our input on the analog stick, it is analog for much the same reason that the jump was analog. We wanted that one-to-one -one feeling, but that was, again, creating some problems for players. So we uh, made a setting to basically make it so you always run. And um, menu of notifications. Um, you're going around and collecting a lot of stuff in our game. There's a lot of optional collectibles. And we found that uh, players were seeing the notifications and choosing not to engage with them because they were in the middle of a challenge. They didn't want to go see that bit of memorabilia that they just picked up. But then they'd come back and they wouldn't really know what had changed. So we created little notifications in the, um, the UI to basically tell you what had changed. And if you could, you could then go and find that thing. Um, we're still committed to uh, releasing more. So there is more that we're working on at the moment. Um, so this is really just the start of our post-release um, journey when it comes to this. So what we learned, we learned an awful lot. And uh, as I say, this talk is trying to cover a lot of ground. So um, this is by no way um, comprehensive, but uh, top of our list of things that we learned. Um, it would have been great if we'd had a broader uh, tester experience range. Um, we certainly did have testers with accessibility needs, but we we could have done better. We know we could have done better and our test partner is already that we work with um, is already looking at ways that we can improve that uh, on our next title. Uh, so we can catch even more of this stuff earlier in development because user testing is also something that we, we didn't do that right at the end. We've been user testing from very, very early in the game um, because there's only so much you can do when you're at the end of a development cycle. And if you get in there nice and early, it, that's the point you can make the most meaningful changes to the game design. So having that amount of input early on um, was really useful to us this time. And we definitely want to make sure that we have even more of that in the future. Um, that simple input made it very hard to rebind. Um, we have uh, that button being used in a lot of different uh, contexts and um, an unknown consequence of that was we, we wanted to put in uh, in-game um, controller rebinding, um, but it was just very, very tricky for us. Um, the switch does allow for um, sort of system level rebinding, but we, we hoped that we could have uh, done more than that. So that's something that next time, I think we'd be a bit more aware of the trade-offs that we were making and probably allow more time uh, UI scaling, um, we definitely had the size of the UI uh, and the potential pitfalls of that in mind, especially in a multiplayer game. Um, but in handheld, the Switch has got a pretty small screen and uh, it would have been great if we could have had some UI scaling in there. Um, we'd have loved to have had a high contrast mode. That is something we're going to prioritize in future titles. Um, also some color overlay options. Um, this is something that uh, 
we sort of realized like quite far into development would uh, open up our game to so many more people. So that is top of our list. Um, and also user font selection. Um, we have a quite a lot of text in our game. There's quite a lot of dialogue. And uh, even though it's a simple game, um, there's uh, quite a few menus. Um, it would have been great to have had some, some font options that players could uh, choose between. Uh, as I say, there's so much more that we would have loved to have done, um, but I would be sat here all day if I was, if I kind of had to go through and name them all out. So what's the motivation for us doing this? Um, it's honestly hearing stories about people saying that this is their first time being able to experience a game like this. Um, it's so kind of uh, heartening to hear. Um, Sometimes it can be a bit scary uh, going and listening to what people are saying about your game. Um, but I don't think I've ever had more people uh, talking positively about a game that I've worked on in terms of its approachability and accessibility. Um, and it's just been, uh, it's, it's just been so lovely to experience that. Um, as was previously mentioned, uh, we've also been uh, nominated uh, for Accessibility Innovation of the Year, um, which is just huge. We're so delighted with that, um, to get that recognition, um, especially for something that can sometimes feel uh, quite a sort of like hidden or transparent uh, feature of a game. So it's, it's amazing that we've got awards like this and for us to be nominated is just incredible. Okay, thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Um, I'll be in the Discord, uh, but I'm nowhere else, I'm afraid. Thank you.